What would you say are your strongest traits? Maybe it's your sense of humor, your friendliness, or your leadership. But if I took all your answers, odds are very few of you would rank your self-control very high. Studies show this is one of the traits humans believe they are worst at. But these studies also show if you can improve your self-control, you'll likely live a better life. So how do we do that? Well, I asked social psychologist, Professor Roy Baumeister, the author of one of my favorite books, Willpower, Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength, that exact question. Huge thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video, Professor Baumeister wrote the book on willpower, literally. So I asked him, what is it and how does it relate to motivation? Willpower is a, a kind of limited energy supply uh, that, uh, that the brain and the, uh, the psyche works on, um, enabling you to perform advanced psychological processes, including self-control, which is basically about changing yourself, overriding responses, uh, being different from um, whatever the first impulse is that uh, that shows up. Motivation is the basic desire. Uh, so you can have great self control, but still not do anything if you don't <laughs> if you don't think it's worth it. For willpower, you do a great job at um, illuminating the point of how willpower has sort of separated us uh, from other species and how it changes our lives day to day. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, sure. Uh, Self-control is a really central trait in, in human life. Uh, oddly, the surveys show people think they don't have enough uh, in the uh, positive psychology's list of 24 character strengths. It's the least likely one that people name that this is one of my top strengths. Uh, and the, I think the most likely that people say this is my weakness or my problem, not my strength. Uh, and yet, compared to the other animals uh, from whom we evolved, even our closest relatives like chimpanzees, we have a lot more. Uh, so the glass is, is half full and, and half empty. Uh, it's partly uh, basis of my thinking in the last 20 years is that uh, the, the human mind was, was created by nature and evolution for culture. Culture is how we solve the problems of survival and reproduction. Uh, but culture means you've got to follow the rules, you've got to maintain a, a good reputation, you've got to, um, to some degree, bend your your wishes and inclinations so as to get along better uh, with the group. And so self-control is, is vital for that. There, there are the beginnings of self-control in other species. Uh, evolution doesn't usually make something out of nothing. Um, I think probably the earliest uh, was in animals that live in packs, uh, they sort of have an understanding that the biggest, strongest one gets to eat first. Uh, and so, you know, a smaller animal, well, it sees food and it's hungry. What's more natural than to go and eat it? But it learns pretty soon that if you try to do it out of turn, uh, the big one's going to beat you up. Uh, and so that's probably the beginning of overriding the response. Say, I want to eat that, but I know I shouldn't uh, or else. Uh, and so it inhibits that desire. Uh, in contrast, uh, I mean, we still have that too, I suppose, uh, but the range of things to which humans apply self-control is, is immense. We, we try to control our thoughts by concentrating, by thinking carefully, uh, by shutting annoying thoughts out of our mind, like uh, even just a, you know, a song that's going through your head that drives you nuts. Uh, or, uh, you know, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend that uh, you wish you didn't think about anymore. Um, it, you use it to control your emotions, as in trying to cheer yourself up or, or get into a good mood, or sometimes you have to bring down a good mood if you're going to a funeral or something. Uh, and then uh, uh, controlling your impulse control is familiar, so not acting on every impulse that comes up, which you know, the, the animal brain basically was designed to do that, to have an impulse to... Uh, look for things that were good and then to act on them. And the idea that, oh, well, no, maybe I shouldn't do that because I promised or it's against the law or uh, it's somebody else's property or whatever, that that takes, uh, uh, you know, the impulse is still there. Uh, you just have to override it. And we also use it in work, of course, to try to perform better work and, and play when it's uh, sports and things like that. Um, when you try to get your best performance, keep working when you're tired, uh, issues like should I speed up and get more done but maybe risk more mistakes or should I slow down, be more careful so that there are no mistakes even though uh, it'll take longer or I won't get as much done. Uh, things like that uh, 
uh, are all there. So that, you know, that's the range and diversity of things that, that self-control is applied to. And uh, it really makes life better in a lot of different ways. We're all after the same goal, living a healthy and successful life. So I asked the professor, what traits does psychology prove can lead us there? Psychology has found really two traits that seem to make you better off in almost every sphere they've been studied in. And one is intelligence uh, and one is self-control. And we've been trying to increase intelligence for more than a century without much success. Uh, you can... You know, there are a few things like if you uh, don't feed your children well or abuse them or whatever, you, you can lower their intelligence. But raising it doesn't really work. The, the best parents, it looks like the, the kid's IQ is just whatever their genetic uh, uh, endowment predicts. So the, uh, making people smarter seems to be difficult. Uh, but self-control can really be improved uh, even in adulthood. So it's, it's a major avenue by which uh, psychology and the findings can can improve life for a lot of people. You know, I see almost a through line between the power of bad and the specific point you made about raising intelligence, where in um, the power of bad we talk about or you talk about not doing bad things instead of thinking about doing good things because the bad things carry so much bias there. Um, with intelligence, you can do something to hurt your child's intelligence, very limited in what you can do to actually improve it. Yeah, there's the message uh, to, to parents, uh, you know, the parenting has sort of become more perfectionistic and even competitive in the last few decades. And people want to be the perfect mother and do everything exactly right. And they worry, what if I don't play the right music when in the child's crib or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so there's some child psychology experts who say, oh, it really doesn't. All you got to do is not be in the bottom five or 10%. The worst parents really do damage their kids. But if you're in the top 90%, that's good enough. Uh, and how the kid turns out, you really don't have that much influence. You can do everything right and the kid might mess up. You can be sort of uh, in different medium quality parent and maybe the kid will do great. Uh, you know, there are lots of other influences on the kid. So uh, just avoid the worst, uh, avoid uh, avoid doing doing the harm and then, and then relax. <laughs> yeah, that idea of hyper optimization, I think extends even past parenting. I see that in healthcare where patients come in and say, I want to be checked for everything or I want to uh, make sure that I don't have any illness or I want to make sure I'm eating the perfect diet. And in science, uh, in medicine, that doesn't really exist because no. there's so many factors that not only are taken into account that changing one thing is rarely going to change everything. And then also we never really think about the counter effects to whatever it is that one thing we're changing. Um, and we have that bias very prevalent, yeah. I think, in society today. Do you see that happening? Yes, uh, um, the, this, this trying to be perfect about everything. I, I actually just published another book on, on, on the self, which is something I've been trying to understand for 40 years. Uh, and in the courses of the research for it, I, I read a lot of uh, research on the psychopathology and the self. And one thing that struck me is how many mental illnesses have perfectionism as a, as a, as a symptom. And, you know, as a scientist, and, and I'm sure uh, you too, we sort of instinctively think, well, we should always try to be better. Striving for perfection is, is, is a noble endeavor. But uh, it really causes a lot more, more problems. And that, uh, it'll hold you up. And, and it's often a defense against uh, uh, anxiety or something, but uh, often counterproductive. And as I said, a, a sign of problems. So uh, try to get off the perfectionism bandwagon and, uh, uh, you know, life is pretty good. Uh, and be satisfied with that. Back to the interview in just a second, but first I want to thank Audible for sponsoring this video. I actually found Professor Baumeister's book, Willpower, Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength on Audible. And after listening to it, I knew there was a lot more to uncover, which is why I have him on the channel. I listen to Audible every time I'm on the move, walking bare, going to the gym, even going to the hospital in my car. My favorite part is the multitask I can do while I listen to something in my ear. All you have to do to get started is visit audible.com slash Dr. Mike or text Dr. Mike to 
to the number 500-500. Remember though, doctor is spelled out. And by signing up, you're gonna get a free 30-day trial. As an Audible member, you get access to one credit a month that can be used on any title from their premium selection, such as the latest bestsellers. You'll also get access to Audible Plus catalog, which has guided meditations, podcasts, and so much more. The link is down below, and now let's get back to our interview with Professor Baumeister. While it's clear that self-control was obviously important in day-to-day -day life, I want to narrow down exactly what the research has proven. So I asked, what do you see as the benefits for individuals to increase their self-control, their self-regulation? The lifelong benefits of self-control are immense and, and extremely diverse. Um, people with better self-control, and every study is tracking people from five years old up and up until their 30s, uh, I was from a little starting a little bit later, but going even to the end of life and so on. Uh, so people with better self-control do better in school, better in work, earn more money. Um, and these are averages, you know, it doesn't guarantee it doesn't every every case, but overall uh, it, it works like that. Um, they have they're more popular, they have more friends, their close relationships are stronger and more durable. Uh, they have better physical health, better mental health. Uh, they are less likely to be arrested <laughs> uh, or involved in other sorts of uh, problems like car crashes and unplanned pregnancies. Uh, at the far end of life, they live longer. Uh, you know, another sign of the superior health. Uh, so, you know, that's a lot uh, from a, a psychological trait and, and you can create these benefits for yourself. Two of the foundational pillars of the understanding of self-control and willpower are known as the marshmallow and radish experiments, which were so successful, they actually have led to over a thousand further studies on the subject. Here's how they work. During the marshmallow experiment, children were given a marshmallow. They were told they could eat it now, or if they waited to eat it until later, they would be given two marshmallows. Professors at Stanford watched to see what the children did, and then studied how those children turned out later in life. Those who delayed their gratification seemed to fare better later on in life. Professor Baumeister was actually the one who conducted their original radish experiment. Subjects were placed in front of a plate of freshly baked cookies and radishes. Some were instructed to eat the radishes, while the others were instructed to eat the cookies. The two groups were then joined by a third group who didn't eat anything and instructed to complete several complicated puzzles. Here's what they found. Those who ate the radishes performed worse with the puzzles. Why? Well, it's theorized that eating the radish when faced with the cookies used the most willpower which Baumeister theorized is an expendable resource like gas in your car. So I asked. The two popular um, research studies that we often hear about when we're talking about self-control is obviously the marshmallow experiment, uh, your famous radish cookie experiment. Um, do you feel like these give the, the most accurate representation of the benefits of self-control? Neither of those was designed to show the benefits. They were really aimed at showing how it worked. Um, the, the marshmallow test uh, itself just you know, explored how some children managed to do it, uh, to succeed, to get a larger reward. And uh, uh, then when he started following those kids up as they, as they grew older, he noticed that the ones who had done better in the marshmallow test when they were four years old uh, ended up doing better in school and having fewer disciplinary problems and, uh, and the like, then followed them into adulthood where indeed they uh, had better outcomes and made more money and were more popular and so on. Um, my radish uh, thing was designed to show the, the limited resource or the you know, the willpower model that you use up your willpower on one task, then you don't have as much available uh, if another challenge comes along right away. I can see how the cultural, uh, the socioeconomic effect uh, can play a major role in a study like the marshmallow effect. If your next meal isn't guaranteed because you are living in very poor circumstances, uh, you may want to dive in at the first marshmallow versus if you're wealthier and you can wait and you know that more great stuff is coming along the, the way, you can delay that gratification to an easier degree. It takes less uh, uh, willpower yeah, depletion, if you will. Not only that, but uh, if you're poor, it often becomes the best thing to do is to take immediate gratification because you can't trust that the delayed ones will come through. I, I remember I read that book, uh, The 
Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mom or whatever it was. And she said, well, when her kids ask for something, you never give it to them right away. You say, well, you can have it next week if you uh, do your full piano practice well uh, every day. Um, and so then the kid learns to work for the, the reward, but the, the kid always gets it if, if the kid does uh, live up to the criteria. Um, but in more chaotic, uh, tumultuous households, the parents might say, okay, I'll get it to you next week, but then there's a crisis or a problem and it doesn't happen. So the kid learns pretty much not to trust those things. And the adaptive thing is always go for immediate gratification, which is the right logical strategy in that situation, but it doesn't prepare you for succeeding in a middle-class uh, work-oriented society uh, like the U.S. and Western Europe. So, yes, social class would be a factor there. I don't think that was as big a factor in the original marshmallow test studies. I'd have to go back and check. They they ran them at a special school on Stanford's campus for kids of Stanford professors. And so there's not, not a lot of poor people or uneducated people there. Um, I also want to point out, yes, yeah, socioeconomic status might confound some results if you took the whole population and, and looked at it. But, but self-control is part of the reason that kids of higher socioeconomic status go on to be more successful uh, in a society. Hard work and, and discipline and uh, continuous, reliable, ethical performance uh, do help you become more successful. I mean, starting with completing your education, I, I think uh, sociology and poverty and so on, we're, we're getting outside my expertise, but several researchers have looked at the evidence and said, uh, if you want to avoid poverty, just uh, finish school uh, and get married before you have children, uh, maybe one or two other things. A little bit of self-control to achieve those things um, helps you avoid, avoid the poverty trap. After hearing the importance of self-control and willpower, the most important question still remains. What are some things someone at home can do to improve their self-control, uh, thereby improving their willpower? Self-control seems to work like a muscle. So after you use it, it gets tired, and for a short time, it's not as effective. But if you use it regularly, it does get stronger. And there have been studies done in the US and in Europe and in my lab and in labs of people I never met. And I think there's some in uh, Australia and Asia as well. Um, so that's four of the six populated continents uh, showing that doing regular exercises of self-control will, will make you stronger. Uh, in our studies, we pick fairly arbitrary things because you don't want any surplus meaning there. Scientifically, it's simpler. Uh, so we had things. Well, the first thing we did that worked was posture. Uh, we said, uh, we want you to, for the two weeks, whenever you think of it, stand up straight, sit up straight, improve your posture. Now, we had people keep a record to make sure they really did it. As if, if they don't do the exercises, whatever, you're not going to get stronger. Uh, but the people who did it, you know, then we tested their self-control on things that had nothing to do with posture, but they did better. Um, so there's posture, uh, there are little things that we've done since uh, to improve how you or change how you speak. So we say, <clears throat> try to speak in complete sentences, uh, try not to use uh, curse words or swear words, if, if that's the thing. If you don't use them anyway, you're not going to get any self-control benefit from trying to stop. It, it has to be where you have a normal impulse to do something and then you override it. Uh, one thing, I, I, we studied some of the meditative traditions because religious people uh, generally have better self-control because of the discipline of following those practices. Um, so uh, if you're right-handed, uh, just switch to your left hand for a lot of things that you habitually use your right hand for, whether it's reaching for a doorknob or drinking from a cup, um, using a computer mouse, brushing your teeth. Um, it doesn't matter what you, you do, just pick... Pick some where you would normally automatically do with your right hand. And the goal that exercise is thinking, oh, I want to, I'm going to do it with my right hand, but no, I need to change and do it with my left hand. It doesn't work quite as well for left-handed people because they tend to be more amb ambidextrous. 
Uh, but, uh, but, you know, you can do something like that. Um, taking up minor improvements in your life. I often get interviewed around New Year's because people make New Year's resolutions, which mostly take self-control. As we know, the record of New Year's resolutions is, is rather dismal. Um, most people have given up on all of them by, by the end of, of January. Well, they're trying to do five different things. And remember, you just have one stock of willpower. And each time you put energy into change, making one change, you use up some that's not available for the, the others. Now, I believe in self-improvement, uh, so I don't want to say don't make don't make resolutions, uh, but do them in sequence. If you're going to make five, start with the easiest one. Uh, maybe you're going to make your bed every morning, or uh, um, I could say stop cursing when you're at home, or, or, or whatever. Some small positive change that you can do, and do that until you succeed at it. Once it becomes a habit, then it, uh, again, habits are automatic, so it's not exercise anymore. Uh, it's only exercising your, your self-control muscle as long as you have a bit of a struggle to do it. And the same with the right hand, left hand thing. Once it becomes a habit to open the doors with your left hand, it doesn't, it doesn't build your self-control anymore to do that. You can, you can switch back to your right hand then uh, if, if that takes self-control. Anyway, so completing the first one will make you a little bit stronger and then go on to the second one. Uh, in general, studies find that, that people who go through life trying to improve themselves uh, seem to do the best and you know, are happiest and most successful. So if you approach life, not that I have to be a 100% better person right away or I have to be perfect or anything like that, but it's just that, well... Next year, I want to be a little better than I was last year in, in a couple of respects. And I'm going to go around working in a slow and you know, somewhat relaxed fashion, but just make myself do a little better like that. If you go through life trying to do that, uh, that will strengthen your character. To use the old Victorian term, it will make you a stronger uh, person, uh, improve your self-control muscle. Um, and it will produce external benefits as well. Some feel like self-control is harder for them than others, so much so that they begin to believe that it's their genes causing the problem. So I asked, Do you think that um, self-control is partly or mostly maybe even controlled by a, a genetic predisposition, or is it more environmental learned? Um, I know that's a tricky question, obviously, and very loaded. <laughs> uh, it is. Uh, the genes do not determine absolutely how how you're going to turn out. They don't even determine exactly how tall you're going to be. Uh, and, and height is pretty genetic. But if you don't get enough to eat when you're a child or whatever, you won't, you won't grow as, as tall or uh, some diseases will uh, stunt your growth. So uh, most psychological and personality traits have a substantial genetic performance and a substantial non uh, component rather, uh, and a substantial non genetic uh, aspect. Um, you know, some of the big meta analyses that have looked at the results of dozens or hundreds of studies estimate it's typically about half. Uh, so, uh, so your genes start you in one direction. Uh, you can improve that. Uh, whether if it starts off good, you can improve on good, uh, or you can mess it up too. And the same thing if you start off with a, a weaker genetic start, um, you can improve on that, or you can probably make that worse. So there's, there's plenty of room for hope and, and for change. Uh, but scientifically, I wouldn't bet against uh, there being any genetic uh, contribution at all. I often recommend meditation and mindfulness for my patients and haven't even tried it myself, as I've seen the tremendous benefit it could bring to our lives. So I wondered if there's a connection to willpower. The biggest failures my patients have when I try and help them with mindfulness or uh, recommend that they try meditation is that failure comes very quickly because our minds are not attuned to just not thinking about nothing or yeah. It's very difficult to not think about nothing. And they think that they need to do it in a very specific position for extremely long periods of time. That's not feasible. And just like you can't go and run a, a marathon without any training, you can't expect to sit for one hour still without having any intrusive thoughts. And I think that um, 
we would benefit a lot in terms of boosting our self-control by meditating. Do you see meditation as being a tool for improving willpower? I certainly do. Uh, it's not been studied, but that's my, my impression. As I said, it is pretty well known that religious people in general have higher self-control. There's debate about what is the process by which this happens. Um, but uh, I suspect meditation would would be one. It, it uh, requires you to control your mind. Uh, starting off trying to do it for an hour is probably setting yourself up for failure. Uh, yeah. uh, a friend had an online course that you start with five minutes and uh, you do that for a week just to sit still and try to concentrate counting your breathing or whatever for five minutes. Uh, that. Uh, that, that's good. And then you gradually work up to uh, about 15 as a plateau where you'll start to see benefits after a couple of weeks of 15 minutes. Um, that's at least worth a try. Uh, and uh, it is exercise in self-control because you have to keep bringing your, your thought back. You don't have a blank mind. Uh, you don't uh, stop other thoughts from running all over the place, but you gradually learn to control them and keep bringing your focus back. So, uh, yeah, that is good practice in, in self-control and likely to uh, to build your capability uh, over time. You're probably watching this video on your phone or maybe your computer or even your television. Likely, you're also being bombarded with notifications, desperately trying to pull your attention away. Given how in-demand our focus is in the modern era, I had to ask. Our computers, our cell phones, our TVs are all trying to neuro-hack us into getting our attention. And now with so many choices and even selecting the color of our clothes, our phones, our cars, uh, getting updates on phones, that puts a tremendous strain on our self-control and our ability to have willpower. Do you see that happening more so now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I notice it in, in, in myself, in my own work that, uh, uh, writing a book or writing a scientific paper takes intense, prolonged concentration. And just living in this world where there's email and online things and shopping and uh, constant other temptations, I think it gradually erodes your ability to, to stay focused uh, on something and to uh, work on something in a, in a continuous fashion. Um, you know, uh, Many of us instructors uh, teach students, and uh, you know, sometimes we go in the back to hear, each, uh, hear our, our colleagues, so on, and you see the other students uh, listening to it, and well, they have their computers out, and so they're sort of taking notes, but then they're checking their email, or they're looking at the basketball score, or, uh, or whatever. It's so easy to do. Uh, what's becoming more difficult is to sustain concentration uh, on the same thing. Um, I uh, recently decided I should uh, I used to do some meditation when I was a, a young man, and you know, in the course of demands and so on, I'd given it up. I, I decided I better resume that just to uh, cultivate. It's, it's a great self-control task, uh, med meditation, uh, but particularly to uh, cultivate the the mental power of sustained uh, concentration which uh, modern life just erodes. When I was in college, I was of the mindset that you should never avoid difficult situations and instead use them as opportunities for personal growth. But now I've come to realize the more that I've looked at work like yours, uh, distraction and avoidance can actually be a very valuable technique, especially in the day and age where we live in, um, if it's done for the correct reasons. And a, a point that I could make for myself is, if I'm going through a rough time, let's say on social media, and I'm getting a lot of terrible comments, um, you don't have to force yourself to go and read those to have personal growth. It could be perfectly acceptable and even wise to avoid those comments um, at a time where you're feeling weak or susceptible to anxiety, depression, et cetera. Do you see uh, avoidance or distraction being both a positive and a negative at times? Yes, I, I would say uh, that's true. If it doesn't catch your attention, if it doesn't get into the brain, it's not going to uh, not going to bother you. Um, we know people who are repressors who maintain their good moods by not getting caught up in negative things. They are like this, you know. They 
see when something bad happens, but they quickly turn their attention elsewhere uh, and they don't think about it, they don't elaborate it, and so nothing reminds them of it. Um, it was one of the big surprises of the research when they started looking at these repressors. You know, do they just not have any bad memories? No, they have bad memories, pretty much the same number as, as, as other people. Uh, but they're sort of walled off in the mind. Uh, other things don't remind them. And uh, research on depressed people show that, you know, they're the opposite. Uh, like everything bad is linked to everything else. So you can get them started on one bad thought and it will remind them of another bad thing and another bad thing. Uh, so it's kind of you know, the architecture uh, of the mind in terms of the structures of associations. So, yes, any strategy that gets you off that and there are there are risks if you don't notice dangers well you you, you, yeah, you could uh, be more exposed to them you know you, you need to take problems seriously when you can deal with them uh, but uh, when there's nothing you can do or whether it's in the past or if it's a symbolic thing or whatever uh, then dwelling on it is is not going to help uh, so taking your mind off it and going on to something else is, uh, is, is good. What I find with social sciences and social psychology is a lot of times we're looking for that one-size-fits-all answer, and it's almost never that. Right. Uh, and there's never yeah. a single strategy that's going to fix everything. So right. Um, right. even like when people criticize certain theories within social psychology, they're criticizing them as if they're the one size fits all answer. And I don't think the people who've originally conducted that research were ever meaning for that to be the one size fits all answer. Right. Yes. Uh, people are different. And you know, sometimes you solve one problem and create another, either for individuals or for society as a whole. Um, so... Like I said, it's one reason I gave up on trying to save the world. Uh, my solution could end up making things worse. Uh, yeah. And that was one of the themes in The Power of Bad Book, too, that, that Tierney looked at, that you know, people are, that life is getting better and better, uh, but there are all these crises and, and people are worried about things getting worse and worse. And uh, inflating everything into a crisis then motivates you to take drastic steps, which may well make the problem worse. Mark Zuckerberg and Barack Obama have something in common. No, it's not their sexy haircuts, but rather the fact that they both have infamously said they almost always wear the same thing every day in order to improve their willpower. My last topic that I wanted to discuss was decision fatigue and how okay. like willpower can be depleted. Um, the most famous example I could probably think of is like Mark Zuckerberg saying he wears the same black t-shirt every day to avoid decision fatigue or uh, President yeah. Obama wearing oh. the same colored suit. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Uh, um, I was just presenting on that the, the other day uh, after our work on decision fatigue came out, uh, the Obama, I assume somebody on his staff read the, read the coverage of it. It was in the New York Times and all. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, he said, uh, I have a lot of difficult decisions to make. Uh, it turns out that the, uh, you know, the easy decisions get made down, lower down the chain of command. So the ones that come up to the president are only the really tough ones. And if you're uh, using up your limited willpower deciding what to eat and what to wear, uh, you don't have as much uh, to... Uh, uh, to uh, to deal with the, the real challenges and the important things. Um, I think in ordinary people's life, it takes the form of most people have a pretty fixed routine in the morning. Um, that uh, I mean, you could get up and decide, should I have my shower first or make breakfast first? And what should I have for breakfast? And um, I could take a different route to work and see something different. No, people get up and do the same things in the same sequence because habits do not drain your willpower. Habits are automatic. And so, you know, not that it's necessarily the single best way to do it, but doing it the same way every day conserves your energy for the, the real challenges uh, of the day. Um, so, uh, we found that making decisions is a, is another kind of willpower depletion. Uh, the, the early studies showed that uh, if you make a lot of decisions, then we gave them a test of self-control, like how long they can hold their hand in ice water. Um, well, making the decisions reduced that indeed by half in the original study. Uh, so, again, making choices uses up that willpower that they don't have available anymore. 
uh, for self-control. And we showed it in the other direction too, that uh, exerting self-control, then when people face uh, decisions, they look for easy, easy, simple ways out, low effort, or leave everything exactly the way it is. Um, I don't want to decide now or, or just give me the cheapest, uh, yeah, simplify the, the inputs. Um, so it's important for mom and lots of people are familiar with it. If you make a number of decisions later on, you feel like, I'm tired. I can't make any more. Uh, early in this, uh, one of the research assistants was a post and she'd gotten married and did the, the bridal registry thing where you go to a store and you pick everything that you want. <laughs> and she said, I was so wiped out by the end of that evening. You're deciding what gravy boat should be there and what kind of spoon you want and all those things, mm -hmm. decision after decision, uh, that that's extremely draining. And uh, at the end of that, so you could have talked me into anything. <laughs> <laughs> and you found that there was a metabolic cost to this, right? Yes, uh, getting a dose of glucose or getting uh, food uh, often restores people's uh, ability to exert self-control or make decisions. Um, some of the, I worked a paper with uh, uh, lawyers who work on uh, negotiations and uh, uh, mediation, things like that. And they sort of manage the two sides as to when they should get food and you know, let them kind of basically deplete themselves, uh, trying to make uh, counter offers and demanding this or that. And, and then give them some food and uh, 20 minutes later, they'll start to have more self-control and can look at things both sides and uh, maybe make a, a resolution. You know, you're looking to get into the, with the negotiation, into the space where it's acceptable to both sides. So you may start with unrealistic demands that the other will never accept. Um, so, uh, yeah, it appears I mean, there, there has to be some metabolic cost. Uh, there are a couple other different theories about what goes on in the willpower depletion. Um, and uh, you know, they're all plausible to me. In fact, they all could be true. Uh, that's probably not just one, one mechanism of there. So um, I don't know if I'll live long enough to have see the researchers have that sorted out. Uh, certainly, you know, brain work and so on is beyond what, what my lab can do. Um, nevertheless, yeah, there's clearly something happening metabolically as, as well. And when we talk about energy, it's probably more than a metaphor. I mean, the term willpower is a metaphor, uh, but it may, it may correspond to some real energy or some real resource that gets depleted in, uh, in the body and the brain. While I love the philosophical discussion, I also want the good stuff. You know what I mean. The actual techniques and tricks to improve your willpower. Here's what the professor had to offer. Do you have any strategies on how we can uh, improve our uh, willpower bank or boost our willpower bank? Well, yes. Uh, as I said, there are exercises to make you stronger in the long run. Uh, in the short run, um, food and rest uh, often uh, do well. Uh, we've also had some good results with... Uh, positive emotion uh, that doesn't really restore your willpower, but it seems to make you more willing to continue exerting it. It, it reduces the sort of anxious, oh, I better conserve my remaining resources. Um, so uh, having something pleasant happen or even just reading some funny uh, things that make you laugh, uh, that will work uh, a little bit, especially when you're not too depleted. Um, food and sleep are major uh, inputs into the body's energy and ability to uh, manage themselves. Um, and uh, I have lots of studies that uh, sort of wipe out the willpower depletion effect if we can give people uh, food or a, a dose of glucose. Usually what we do uh, is uh, give them a glass of lemonade that's mixed with either a sweetener or with actual sugar. Uh, because they can do a, a complete double blind that the experimenter doesn't know what the drink is and the, the person doesn't know they both taste good. Uh, the sugar will wipe out the effect because it, it actually gives you energy and the, the diet sweetener uh, doesn't. I, I tend to tell my students uh, you know, before the exam, maybe you want a real Coke rather than a diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. What about automating tasks and creating habits? Uh, you talked about uh, some specific examples within your book. Yeah, this is a really important thing. This was a big change in my thinking that what people with good self-control do, they're not constantly struggling and battling and overcoming their impulses. Rather, what they do is they break their bad habits and they form good habits. And habitual behavior is, is automatic. It doesn't take energy. Uh, so then life runs 
very smoothly uh, just by uh, by habit. Our, one of the early surprises is we tracked people of going about their daily lives in terms of how often they had desires and how often they resisted them. So we thought, well, people with high self-control but for resisting desires, they're going to resist them more. It was the opposite. They were significantly less likely to say they resisted their desires. Uh, we kind of dug into the data. They didn't get themselves into situations where they had problem desires that they had to resist. So if you're trying to quit drinking, you don't go into a bar with your friends and say, I'll just have a Coke. Uh, and, uh, and then it smells good and the beer looks good or whatever. And then you have to fight with that. The person with high self-control just says, no, I'm not going in there. Um, and the same with sex and laziness and all sorts of other temptations. Uh, if uh, you can set yourself life up to run automatically, uh, then it goes smoothly and, and, and easily. And the final one's putting things down on paper and getting them out of your mind so you don't have to carry that mental load, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you give yourself very specific instructions, then the unconscious knows what to do. It, it can't deal with vague, grand plans like, uh, I need to be a better person or I should study more. Uh, and so it's bugging you all the time. Well, what do you mean? What should I do? But <laughs> if you say, all right, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, I'll get out the book and I'll start studying then the unconscious is satisfied and it doesn't have to bother you until 10 o'clock. It says, ding, okay, he said, let's study now, let's do it. Social psychology is facing a crisis of replication where we're looking for previous studies to be able to be redone and get the same results. But perhaps we're drawing the wrong conclusions or have changed our knowledge about the effects of these incredibly specific experiments. For those who have critiqued the marshmallow study, for example. They talked about the reproducibility crisis, that these some of these studies couldn't be redone, or the fact that they believe that there was a, a higher chance of socioeconomic factors playing into this. Um, what's your take on that? Reproducibility problem is, is there through all the sciences, and it's protect, perhaps particularly acute in psychology. I'm not completely sure whether we're just more sensitive to it or it's a bigger problem for us than others. Uh, I mean, it actually started in, in, in medicine. Uh, as you know, uh, Ioannidis' is a paper that uh, most medical research findings are false. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something we all struggle with. Uh, I'm inclined to believe, um, although, although, you know, replication is important and, and, and so on, uh, um, I'm trying to believe most researchers are honest and doing good things. Now, the original findings as published tend to have bigger size effects than, than the follow-ups. And it's not clear whether the original researchers took more care because they were more inspired than, you know, after all, if you're just repeating somebody else's work, maybe you don't work as hard or you don't try as hard as if this is your original idea. Uh, on the other hand, there's certainly publication bias, so a researcher with a clever idea might try three or four different ways of testing it, and then they'll publish the best one, the one that, that turns out the best. Some of that is luck. I'm inclined to think things that have been found multiple times, I have a, I have a fair amount of confidence in. You know, if one person found it once and somebody else tries and doesn't get it, well, then I'm suspicious. Uh, but... By the time four or five different laboratories have produced similar effects, I'm inclined to think there's something real there, even if uh, several others will say, well, we tried it and it didn't quite work for us. Some people think coffee boosts their willpower. Here's the truth about what coffee does to your body, though. As always, stay happy and healthy.